streamed on Facebook, by Excluded UK, by Liverpool City Region and by Grand Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, I will ask you all to please mute and I do have a mute all button because sometimes the background noise can be very disturbing and get feedback and such like. So um, if, you, if I could ask you all just to mute, for media colleagues who are on the call, um, I will come to Facebook you at the end, towards the end okay. of the event. First of all, we're going to hear um, from a number of people from Excluded UK and hear their stories. And we'll have some feedback from Andy and from Steve as the two city regional mayors. Um, and in a moment, I will hand over to Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester. We also have Steve Rotherham, the mayor of the Liverpool city region. And also joining us this evening, I'm pleased to say, is Sonali Joshi, who is the founder and director of communications and policy for Excluded UK. And Sonali will introduce some of the people that some of you may know, or others, um, you'll hear the stories of those people that are part of the Excluded UK movement. So as I say, for media, once we've heard from all of those colleagues, I will come to you if you have questions. And you can indicate in chat to me if you particularly have a question that you want to ask. And that's particularly for the media, because given we now have over 300 people on the call, I'm not gonna be able to obviously get through everyone's questions or comments, so I'm afraid. But I hope you have an enjoyable evening and an informative evening. And I'm going to hand over now to Andy Burnham. Well, thanks very much indeed, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is an amazing event, actually, because I'm just looking at all of the messages coming in from all over the country. People are joining us from, from everywhere. We are in the heart of the northwest of England here tonight, but you're coming in from, from all parts. Uh, and that tells you something, doesn't it, about Excluded UK. This is a campaign that is uh, kind of touching the lives of many people all over the country, bringing people together. Um, and, you know, congratulations actually to all of those who built the campaign to this point. Tonight, Steve Rotherham and I want to see if we can just help you uh, go that further uh, step forward by um, giving you this, this platform. And that's what tonight is, is all about. I'm going to start with something that you won't believe me saying, but you know, I'm going to start by saying I have some sympathy for the government in that... It has been a difficult year for them, and they've been having to move at pace, dealing with enormous challenges, probably that any government hasn't dealt with in, in, in recent times, including the ones that, that I was in. I did deal with a pandemic a decade ago, but it was nothing like uh, this one. So, you know, I do have some sympathy, but here's the but. Where I am less forgiving, in fact, where I'm not forgiving, is when kind of mistakes are pointed out to them or gaps are pointed out to them and they continue to, to ignore those things. They just sort of, uh, you know, push them, push them to one side. We've seen that with Test and Trace, uh, but we've definitely seen that with um, economic support. And I pointed out to them very directly a couple of weeks ago how it just was not right uh, to, um, to pay people who worked in uh, pubs and bookmakers and bingo halls 67% of their wages. And it took quite a big effort to make them uh, change their mind about that but, but obviously there are other gaps that they haven't uh, dealt with and they continue uh, to ignore and it's not gaps actually it's people it's people it's families it's children uh, this is uh, kind of a huge number of people across the country who've been ignored uh, all year and it's time that they were given their chance uh, to say how it feels and what needs to be to be done. You know, the second national lockdown has now been introduced and the same mistake has been repeated or the same um, uh, neglect has been, has, been, um, has been made. And that is of thousands of people, as I say, struggling. Thousands, hundreds of thousands have been frozen out of support uh, during the whole of this pandemic and again during this second national lockdown. It is unforgivable in my view to say to people who are people who um, work uh, hard for a living, who pay their tax, that they're not worthy of any meaningful support. How can that possibly be, be uh, right and just? It can't be and it needs uh, to, to change. It's an injustice on a major scale 
But it's also, in some ways, a hidden injustice up to this point. As I say, Excluded UK have done a brilliant job bringing people together. But I'm not sure the British public yet have heard all of the voices of people who've been affected by the denial of proper support uh, for people in so many ways across uh, our economy. And tonight is really about giving a chance for those voices uh, to be heard. They're beginning to be heard, but now we want to be, them to be heard really loudly and really clearly. So believe it or not, tonight is not about the politicians, about me or Steve, although we will say our bit here and there. Uh, tonight is about the people who are suffering in our country right now, who've been denied the support that they should have been given. Yes, this is voices coming out of Greater Manchester and the Liverpool city region tonight, but we know the people on this call will be speaking for people in all parts of the UK. And it's about time that they were heard. It's about time that the government listened uh, to the voices that you're about uh, to hear. That's what tonight is about. Steve and I will make our own calls towards the end uh, of the presentation, but I'm just hoping that this campaign is beginning to become undeniable, unstoppable, and that we will soon have justice for those who've been excluded uh, this year, frozen out. It can't continue, and we're here to make sure that it doesn't. So I'll leave it there for now, and I'm going to hand over to my great friend and colleague down the M62, uh, the Mayor of the Liverpool City Region, uh, Steve Rotham. Steve. Thanks, Andy. Handing over to the home of the current Premier League champions. Um, you can see that we're friends, otherwise that one wouldn't go down very well with Andy. Look, um, first of all, I think the starting point is to, to, to thank Sonali and all of those colleagues from Exclusive UK who've done such a fantastic job so far. But the government have been saying that they have been listening. Um, Andy's just referred to it now. But if they are listening, then they're not hearing what's happening. And what is happening is an absolute travesty on a, a biblical scale. Um, lives being affected every single day and the government refusing to respond to those problems. It's a deep, deep injustice. And the government um, have been um, told of those gaps that Andy explained, but they're not plugging those gaps. And it, it's for any government to respond to its safety net to ensure that it captures as many people as possible uh, and it hasn't uh, responded to the problem. So the idea is that the three million people now will have a voice, of course, through excluded. And don't forget, you can um, tweet um, through uh, hashtag excluded UK, um, but it will be a voice. And those pen pictures that we will hear uh, those stories of the effect on individuals' lives, I think, will go a long way to explain why people feel so frustrated but angry at the government for doing nothing when it's being told what the problem is. So, we, you know, myself and, and Andy and others have raised this on numerous occasions. We're trying to build momentum through the, the political process. Uh, Sadiq Khan, um, Dan Jarvis... Jamie Driscoll, myself and Andy as the five Metro mayors um, from the Labour perspective, we've all said that we are very supportive of the aims of the campaign. It's now for others to also get on board. Um, what I would say is that sometimes these things do take time. I know that's not something that you've got. Some things these, sometimes these things do take time. Um, don't give up. We won't give up. We'll be alongside you on the journey. Um, we believe now that there is an unstoppable force, that the government will have to eventually do the right things. Um, we've um, campaigned on a number of issues in a, a COVID world and been successful. What we do need is to hear from um, all of those people who've got individual stories. And I think that will speak more powerfully than anybody in the chamber of the House of Commons or any politician outside of that could ever do. So with that, Sonali... Uh, congratulations for what you've done. I'll hand over to you so that we can hear from those people about their individual stories. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Steve. And thank you all for joining us this evening. It's really great to see so many of you on this call. 
Excluded UK is a volunteer-run grassroots organisation formed in response to the many exclusions to the government COVID-19 financial support schemes that became apparent following the Chancellor's announcements of these schemes back in March. Excluded UK has a Facebook community of over 22,500, a Twitter following of around the same number, plus several thousand more on our website forum. While many people have been helped by the furlough scheme, the self-employed income support scheme, an estimated 3 million individuals and businesses, equating to 10% of the UK workforce, have not received any meaningful support. These exclusions appear to have no policy rationale behind them, with arbitrary hard edges to the eligibility criteria, leaving millions entirely or largely excluded from support through no fault of their own. From people furthering their careers by starting a new job, to those who took the plunge to set up a new business, those with entrepreneurial spirit, serving their communities and beyond as small business owners, freelancers, those working a combination of PAYE and self-employment, those whose parental leave fell at a certain time, people caught out by pensions, bereavement payments, redundancy, shielding, and more. These gaps are unfair, unjust, and discriminatory. These are people from every walk of life, from beauticians to dog groomers, charity workers, construction workers, nurses, teachers, creative professionals, lawyers, and more. The three million figure was based on data from HMRC, ONS, and the Department of Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, and has been backed up by various organizations and commentators. And in fact, the National Audit Office report of the 23rd of October puts the figure at 2.9 million. Excluded UK has received thousands of testimonies from those affected, which clearly illustrate the profound impacts and ramifications of being excluded. Escalating financial hardship and mounting debt now almost eight months on, an increasingly severe mental health crisis, and their knock-on effects on children, education, single parents, families, households, the elderly and beyond. These impacts are only becoming more acute as time passes. Urgent redress is vital, not least to aid the country's economic recovery. This is an issue of fairness and deep social injustice. Despite considerable cross-party support from MPs, parliamentary questions and letters to the Treasury have been met with the same repeated stock responses. Not least yesterday with a question posed by the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer at PMQs. The Prime Minister was quick to respond in the same manner as we've heard time and again from the Chancellor and from government, referring to those who have been helped. He stated that 2.6 million have been helped by the self-employed income support scheme, but failed to acknowledge 3 million who've not been helped in any meaningful way at all. So now we're going to hear from a number of affected individuals from Manchester and Liverpool who will shed light on the stark human stories behind the 3 million figure. On behalf of Excluded UK, I'd like to thank Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham for hosting this event and for their ongoing support in helping illustrate the depth of this unfairness and injustice. So we'll now go on to our speakers who've joined us this evening to share their stories and I'll turn to each uh, in turn one by one. So I'm going to start with uh, Mark Goff. Mark. Hello. Hi, how are you? Like yeah, hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you to uh, Excluded UK, um, obviously Steve, um, uh, Andy, um, Aaron, and obviously Sonali for obviously giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, so my name is Mark. Um, so I own a, a company called White House Event Crockery. Um, we're based in Manchester um, and we are in the weddings and event industry. This sector has been completely and utterly decimated. The wedding and event sector is the fifth biggest economy in the UK. It contributes roughly between £79 billion pounds towards the economy. We have been completely left in the lurch. As a business, um, unfortunately, I've had to make three members of staff redundant. Um, I, I did get the hospitality grant. Um, it took me three attempts to get the grant. Because we weren't retail, because we were on the high street, I operate a 10,000 square foot warehouse. Um, I was rejected three times which was heartbreaking and, 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 and you know, to, to walk into work on a, on a daily basis, to, you know, to, to, to deal with my staff, to deal with the, the, the hundreds of brides who have booked their weddings uh, and have had to move them once, twice, three times, you know, to 2021, to 2022, to 2023, brides cancelling, having to give refunds with no support whatsoever it is heartbreaking. Um, you know, even, even now as a business, um, we've got no support. 
as a bit as a sector, we cannot supply to any wedding or event because we're in lockdown. So we have no income. However, we are not closed down by the government and we do not qualify for any grants. How, how, how is that right? It, it's, it, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You, and you see businesses who are operating, uh, uh, still operating, claiming the grants, and it's, and it's simply not fair. And I'm also a director. I've claimed no money whatsoever. I've not taken a salary for the last eight months. I have to walk into my warehouse when, you know, when, we, when we were able to work every single day to continue running the business uh, and, to, and to look around a 10,000 square foot, square foot warehouse full of stock that should be out uh, every, everywhere, all over the UK to supply to weddings and events is heartbreaking. You know, we are a three quarters of a million pound turnover business. My business so far this year has turned over 35,000 pounds. We are 98% down on turnover and it's heartbreaking. Uh, we are a viable business. I can't retrain. I've got a degree. I can't mothball my business. I'm here to support all the thousands, hundreds and thousands of brides who have booked us, you know, for 2021, for 2022. It's not that simple. We need help. We need direct government help to support the specific sector of weddings and events. And to all the directors that also need that help to survive and to support their families uh, and so to continue their businesses. Thank you, Mark. Um, so we'll now turn to James Cawthron. Hello. Hi, James. Hi. Um, just going on really from what Mark has said there, uh, my name is James. I'm 43. I'm, um, I have a little girl, Megan. Um, I'm a contractor in the financial services sector, a lot smaller than Mark's business, but still um, I am a managing director of my own company. Um, so throughout the four years that I was contracting, I have paid obviously all of my corporation tax and my dividend taxes. And prior to that, since I was 18, I've always worked in the financial sector, either in insurance or banking. So I've paid all my taxes and national insurances then as well. Um, I think one of the key areas that I found quite challenging is unfortunately at the beginning of um, lockdown, I was actually quite ill and I was in entry hospital with suspected COVID and I was in there for five weeks. Um, I had numerous negative tests but the hospital obviously deemed that I was still ill enough that I need to stay and get treatment during that time the contract that I was on was cancelled um, because of lockdown and this is what can happen to contractors as well and then we find out the furlough is coming along which is going to be fantastic but unfortunately almost every area that furlough where um, I need to qualify for furlough I couldn't do I didn't have a business premises um I couldn't um, claim universal credits due to any savings that we'd accumulated. And then when we did find that we could get some furlough help, it would only be on a very small amount of my salary because they wouldn't look at any dividends or anything like that that you've put into the system. So I think really the main area that I'm sort of confused with is that we have the, um, the APG that's been set up. We know that Parliament understands what's happening. The government has been given numerous opportunities to help resolve the situation that the three million are in. We all do a lot of work on Twitter and so on to get the message out there. But either Boris or Rishi or the government at, at, at this time have decided that they are going to ignore us. And I think we're getting to the point now where with the leaders that we have here, the mayors and so on, the questions need to be asked of why is the government ignoring us? Why is Rishi so determined not to support us when he knows these are the businesses, as Mark was talking, they're very high turnover businesses, pay a lot of tax into the system. We're paying our taxes. We're taking our part. We are the, the, the entrepreneurs who are going to be the future. And yet the government and the chancellor seem to want to sort of put a bit of a kibosh on that. Now, if we think of the future, when we go past Christmas, going into 2021, 22 and 23, if these businesses aren't there that employ people, how is the government going to get this revenue back? How is the government going to get this money back? You know, I'm not Amazon. I don't have a fantastic accountant who can make my bill to next to nothing. So if he wants this, if he needs this money back in the end that we're giving out to normal furlough employees, 
it's businesses like ours that he's going to need to help. And I still don't understand why he won't support us, because in the future, he's just damaging the economy. Thank you, James. We'll now turn to Marie Hinsby. Marie. Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I've not Hi. done Zoom before, so it's all a bit new. Um, I'm a freelance engineer um, and I worked part time. Um, but as a director of a limited company, I'm excluded. Um, but unfortunately, my husband is also excluded because he fell foul of the 50-50 rule. Um, he's, he works for agencies and sometimes it's PAYE, sometimes it's self-employed. So obviously does, does his um, self-assessment every year, files his returns, pays his taxes. But because last year, it was slightly more PAYE than it was self-employment. He wasn't able to get any self-employment grant. So I've had, to, I've been fortunate that I have had some work come in. So I've not been able to furlough myself on the small amount of PAYE that I earn. Because again, most of my pay comes through dividends, which you pay the same tax on essentially as PAYE anyway. I don't know where the government get this idea that we don't pay tax on dividends because we pay the corporation tax before we pay ourselves and then we pay tax again. So um, I've had to work further and further away. It's It's been, it's been a gruelling eight months and I'm exhausted and just the feeling of not being part of the community because the government deem we're not worthy of any financial support is crushing. And I think, even, no, I, sorry, I, it's, I, sorry, I get so emotional talking about it because it's, it's the exclusion and having to spend all our savings just to survive. It's so, it's just so hard now. And I don't know whether next week I've got work or not. At the moment, I've, I've got a few days a week. It's, it's okay, but I don't know what's around the corner. And funds are getting less and less. And yeah, that's it. That's, that's all I can really say on it. Thanks, Marie. And sorry to hear that both you and your husband have been affected. That's it's really devastating to hear. Thank you. Um, we'll turn to Anthony Higginson. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm an independent bookseller, not a bookshop. I used to have a bookshop. Sadly, that closed. And I also run um, festival events. I do uh, pop-up storytelling and we have entertainment for the public. Uh, and also I'm involved in uh, a new venture, which is photography, um, all of which you can't basically do. So I normally go around schools and libraries, either on my own and do a presentation about reading. I present them information about famous authors, brand new authors. I work with everybody. I've not been able to set foot in a school since March the 11th. And March is my busiest month. There's a thing called World Book Day. And every year that for me has got bigger and bigger. Uh, I have bookings every day in March going into April. September, I do a real doll show. I get dressed up as Willy Wonka. I have a friend who illustrates the artwork of, of Roald Dahl. Um, you know, we, we tell children in schools across Manchester, Liverpool, anywhere really, all about one of the world's biggest storytellers. We've not been able to do any of this work th this year um, because I was told by my authority, by Sefton, to set up a limited company for account transparency. Because um, technically there's only me does my work. I have people who work with me. And sometimes I, I actually pay them and put it through my my own, you know, accounts, so to speak. Um, but 
you know, I was told we, we don't want to deal with you as an individual. We want to deal with you as a company. And then when you ask, say, well, you know who I am, you know, I'm on your books. And they say, oh, we haven't got rates anymore. So we can't give you a retail grant. But I do, I do, I do events, I do storytelling, I do, I do all sorts of art and craft activities, which I've learned to do over the last two or three or four years. And we, we had 2,000 people for the last six years as a Viking festival in Formby that I organise. And that had to be cancelled this year. That, we do that for free, basically. We charge a pound a head to cover the insurance and the rent and things like that. And, and it's a wonderful day out. And we, we've not been able to do that this year. Last year, I worked at the Albert Dock in the summer holidays, doing stories, art and craft. You, you, you can go and see it all. It was superbly received. It, don't get paid a vast amount. I get paid £200 plus VAT a day. Sounds like a lot. It's not when you consider the work that goes in. And that income has just been taken away from me instantly this year. You'd like to think it will come back next year, but there's no way of knowing. Um, I've had to invest a lot into my business. So when when you get judged as not making a profit, so you can't have a, a you know a size grant or something, I'm thinking, but I've, I've spent like 30 grand a year to for stock. I'm, I sell books. I have got fifteen thousand pounds worth of books in boxes in my hall, my bedroom, in the porch. I can't go and do a books. I can't go and do a parents evening September and October basically I work 20 hours a day getting ready going from one school to another I set tables up I'm there to advise to help to encourage I don't get paid for that I do it because I love doing it and I make a small profit from the sale of the books and I'm competing with Amazon the give books away basically and you know I, the longer this goes on I just keep thinking what are people supposed to do? The books I've got, I, I can send them back, but they give me a credit for a future order. They don't give me my money back. It, it's an ongoing mechanism of trade. It's not, oh, oh, you don't want them, here's your money back. It doesn't work like that. So when I buy them in March to do a whole month of World Book Day events in, in schools across Manchester, Bolton, Liverpool, Preston, I even occasionally go as far as Oxford and Nottingham. I've got friends I've, I've gained who say, so could you come down to Nottingham for a week? And I'll drive for five hours to do a book fair in a school. And I'm thinking, you know, not many people can do that. But I'm not, I'm being told, oh, you, you, you're not fit to, to be given support. So I'm not asking for a lot as it goes. You know, a couple hundred quid a week would have kept me going because luckily, I live in a house that is owned by my father. My mum died. I moved back in and I helped my dad look, you know, look after himself. You know, my daughter's been in total isolation throughout this because she's got asthma. She's really quite poorly. She's got two young children. I've hardly seen her. You know, and, and the knock-on effect on things like the photography side of things is I've got a friend um, who runs vampire.com website above my head. He can't have models in to take photos. He can't go out and, and shoot a wedding and um, shoot PR photos for, for a local Amdram or anything like that, all of which is, is done locally. Um, no one can do this work, but no one's given me, him, or, or any of you guys any respect, let alone any finances. And everyone should be treated fairly, you know, if, if you can give two and a half thousand pound in furlough, which is free money to someone to stay at home and watch Netflix and tidy their garden and paint the house. Well, why can't the rest of us have had 100 quid a week or 200 quid a week to see us over a difficult time? And would have been a lot easier to, to monitor how close you are to people and things like that if you weren't worried about the fact that you've got to get food, you've got to pay bills and with, with nothing. Um, it, we're just we've been treated like outcasts and pariahs and none of us have done anything wrong you know and it's superb that Andy and Steve and people like that are, are, are on board but ultimately it, it goes to the top and we've got people down in London who do not seem to care or understand whatsoever about ordinary people some of whom voted for them you know they, they, they don't seem to understand in the future there's going to be another election well, you know, they'll be out of a job. And won't that be won't that be nice? Well, it's not nice to be out of a job if it's something you've done 
I've done what I've done for 33 years. I've, I've taken qualifications on board. I've learned and adapted since, since the shop closed. I've learned to do art. I've learned to do photography. I can do also, I can make musical instruments out of cardboard and elastic bands nowadays. And kids love that because it's hands-on activity, but I'm not near, allowed near a child, am I? Even though I've got a DBS certificate, I'm, I've got three insurance policies I'm paying for, plus my car insurance, because I have to be insured for each of the things I do. One insurance policy won't cover it. So to run events, I need big insurance, as the, the wedding guy will know. To, to, to retail, I need goods and services insurance and, and, to, do, and to do storytelling. I need liability in case I hurl something at a child in a in a session, you know. And it, it, we just need fairness, and the public need to know what what's going on. Some of my friends still think we're just moaning and making it up. And I think you got a furlough. You stayed off for seven weeks and painted your house. And I've I've been I, I wake up at two o'clock in the night having a panic attack, thinking, what am I doing? What, what am I doing tomorrow? When will I see my children? When will I see my grandchildren? My grandson's too soon. I've only seen him about three times. You know, that's not nice, is it? Anyway, I'm sure everyone else has got something similar to say as I have, but it's affecting everybody. Models who model for photographers, people at weddings who can't have them and can't have their photos taken and things like, you know, videos done you know the sound guy the engineers there's everybody in every industry is is connected and it's a huge ripple that's going to become a tsunami of unemployment so what jobs are we all meant to do work in a warehouse overnight and fill shelves in tesco and amazon warehouse i don't think we sh don't think we should really don't but anyway i'm sure there's you know 20 more people who need to say things so thanks for listening and let's hopefully hear from someone else who can shed light on this. Thank you, Sonali. Thanks, Anthony. And you've touched on a really important point there because we're also talking about supply chains here. Um, we talk about um, the industries that have been hard hit and, and many more, but there's all the supply chains that feed into that. And you touched on that um, you know, uh, really, really uh, powerfully. Thanks, Anthony. We'll now go on to Rebecca Jarvis. Rebecca. Hi, thank you, Snarly. Uh, I'm Rebecca Thanks. Jarvis. I'm a freelancer in TV and theatre. I get taxed at Source. And past seven months, I've not worked. I've not had... <laughs> I've had to go to two charities to help me buy food. I mean, that is just ridiculous. I've had to go cup and hand to two charities and say, can I have some money to buy some food to make sure I've got enough to eat each week? And it's just ridiculous that the government can tax me at source take my tax before i get any money but can't say oh what do you need here's a bit of money to see you all for the next year because bits are closed it's like i was waiting for a, i had a job interview on the 9th 10th of march and i was going to hear back and then boris johnson said theaters don't go there. i was like what and then it, it's just <laughs> it's really bad and then recently i've had issues sleeping for the last few months my doctor's sorting that out thankfully but mental health has not been very good <laughs> recently and it's just so upsetting to see the government just not even say sorry or go oops I made a mistake or even say okay we should do something it's been eight months and they can't even apologize or no we are people who have feelings and pay taxes. And thank you to Andy and St Stephen and Sid UK and a big thank you to Andy for the other week when you mentioned about freelancers. I was like, yes, thank you, that's me. It's just really upsetting sometimes and seeing people's stories. It's like, what do we do next? What can we do? And I really don't know what else to say. So thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I uh, will turn to Tony Scarth. Tony. Well, at the moment, I've got a few days a week. It's, it's okay. I don't know what else to say. So thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Is Tony there?
I think we might have um, lost Tony, so I'm going to turn to Helen McKeon. Hi, my name's Helen. Thank you, everyone, for um, attending this. Thank you, Andy Burnham and Steve Rotherham, for helping make our voice louder. Um, I'm a 40 year old mom of two. I'm a chartered surveyor and I was denied furlough by an employer locally in Manchester. Um, and I was denied furlough um, and made redundant the same week that I received the shielding letters for my six year old son who has a lung condition. So I was not only denied any financial help on a cliff edge, but I was made redundant. So I wasn't even put on uh, statutory sick pay or any other kind of um, support and not entitled to any other support or benefits from, um, from that point onwards. So I've been excluded for eight months. Uh, I'm currently looking for alternative work um, that fits around the children and school and childminding uh, availability, which is also an issue at the minute because there's a lot of childminders who are not receiving any help as home work working based businesses. There's a lot of childminders struggling at the minute financially as well because they have not received the discretionary grants from the local authorities. So when it comes to working moms and working parents, um, you're in a very difficult position, especially if you are a single parent where you don't have any form of backup support within the family to help you to go out to interviews or um, work, especially if you're, for example, like myself, a surveyor or Marie, who's an engineer, you, you, need, you need to have that support network around you to be able to go out to work. So be denied the furlough um, meant that once my uh, February March pay was spent, that was it. So there was no there was no warning, there was no preparation enabled. It was a matter of, oh, you've received the shielding letter. Oh, you're being made redundant. There was no proper process, and employers should never have been made the gatekeepers to who got furlough and who didn't. It was too open to abuse and discrimination, and. Um, it's a dire situation for all those in the denied furlough category. Thanks, Helen. And now we'll move on to uh, Lowry Williams. Hello, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, fantastic work that everyone's doing on Excluded. Um, I work in the events industry. Um, I started in drama in school when I was 15 and I'm now 49. I've given my entire life to the events industry and love every minute of being part of that, um, that environment. Um, three years ago, I had a company which I'd had for 12 years with an ex-partner. Um, I lost that, um, got left with a load of debt, uh, credit rating ruined. Um, so I fought for three years just to keep going and start again. Um, I was helped to set up a limited company two years ago um, because when you're dealing with large suppliers, they need you to be a limited company. Um, again, it's just me. So I didn't set up PAYE or anything like that. I didn't actually think I'd earn enough um, because my mental health had taken a big knock, losing um, a big part of my life of 12 years. Now, I think in a, in a sense, I'm a lot stronger than maybe some people who are dealing with this at the moment, purely because I've had to struggle for three years. Um, but being 40, nearly 47, 46, having to then go on to job seekers allowance when you've had a company earning decent turnover, paying corporation tax and VAT and everything else for years, and being a single mum now, um, my, my working capacity has been reduced. Um, so setting up the uh, limited company um, was a chance for me with people I knew in the industry to get back out there, stand on my own two feet and start getting back to doing what I needed to do. Um, now, because of that um, and a low income, I was on JobSeekers Allowance. Um, this changed to Universal Credit in 2019. And on the 20, um, when Universal Credit came in, I explained to my situation what I was doing, that I was 
classed as what they said as self-employed. And on their system, I still am self-employed. And every month I have to put my figures in so that I get an allowance off universal credit. Um, having limited company, I tried for the, uh, the self-employment self scheme, got knocked back, um, kept going on the self-assessment thinking, maybe I've not put something in. Now, I do have a fine of £1,300 from HMRC uh, for not putting a self-assessment in um, after I lost my company. Now, that means to me that I am classed as self-employed because they have fined me for not putting a self-assessment in. However, when I've queried with HMRC um, about why I've not been allowed to have a grant and going on the system, and then the system actually telling me I didn't need to put a self-assessment form in, um, I queried that and they said, we took you off self-assessment because you're actually limited company director, therefore you're not self-employed. So that's that. Now, I've been fortunate because I've had a little bit of work but that work has been in the events industry with people who have technology companies. That work has now stopped. So as of next month, um, I don't know if I can pay my mortgage. I have no savings. My credit rating is absolutely destroyed because of what's happened with my last company. Again, that was none of my own fault, but that's how I've been left. So as a single mother, I have no access to credit cards, um, loans, anything whatsoever. Um, I think I'm on, on Twitter the other day, I put my bank statement up there to try and prove to Rishi and Boris, who are saying that we all have £200,000 in the bank, that as a single mother with a pound in a business account and a pound in another account, this is how majority of us are living at the moment, which is not acceptable. Um, I have used the food bank because I know it's there. Um, and as I said, I've, I've done this for three years, so I know how to survive. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have earned decent money over the years and paid all their taxes all across the events and hospitality industries that have had no help whatsoever, who have never been in this situation. Um, there are people committing suicide. There are people selling their family homes with children because they have no money to pay the mortgages. Um, it's absolutely dire out there. Um, we, we need help. We need to actually be treated fairly. We are not being treated as equals as everybody else is. You know, if you've got furlough, you're fine. You're fine if you're an employee on furlough. If you're a director of that company, it's absolutely catastroc catastrophically awful because majority of these companies, whilst they're given furlough money, still have to pay PAYE, national insurance, and there's zero coming into that company. So overhead, rent, insurance, assets, everything else, there is nothing going into any company and yet the government still accept them to, you know, trying to say, keep the staff on, we'll give you a percentage of this, but they're, they're not looking at the bigger picture. Um, the, the, the events industry is absolutely decimated. Um, I'm actually over in Blackpool, I have worked in Manchester and a lot of us are all, you know, we all work across Lancashire and all over the UK and, and abroad. Um, it is time that, that you know we do a vote in a confidence something we have to get this sorted um we can't accept any more uh suicides it's not on i know what losing my company of 12 years did to me and i know the people and we do know across the events industry at the moment the desperation there are people sofa surfing there are plenty on here and excluded and all the other groups that are trying to fight for their own basic rights in the uk in 2020 to survive and you know we're not a third world country. We all pay our taxes, our corporation taxes. I'm sat here now with this £1,300 fine for, for this self-assessment. I've actually just written a letter to say, can you please clarify HMRC, if you are fining me for a self-assessment for being self-employed, please clarify that I am self-employed. However, if you're saying I'm not self-employed and I'm not entitled to any of these schemes, you have actually sent me a bill by mistake. Um, and, and, you know, all these organisations to do with the government and that the issue I have at the moment is on, I've got universal credit that class me as self-employed and every month they want every in, every out, expenditure, everything, and that gives them a figure to give me on universal credit. HMRC say I am not self-employed. And these are two government departments that are not speaking to each other. Um, so, you know, I, I just... I, Again, I have a backbone of steel only because I've had to. Um, and I, I class myself as lucky purely because I've, I've learned to survive. But the fact there are thousands of families having to go to food bank in the UK, the so-called Great Britain, it's not acceptable. Boris and Rishi sit there. Their kids will have things at Christmas. 
majority of us can't pay our mortgages. Um, the universal credit, whilst it's fine, isn't enough to pay a mortgage. Any of us that have worked hard all our lives to have a house, you know, we're not, we're, majority of us are not millionaires. We do what we do because we love it. Um, we don't get a penny help from, you know, from any of the government schemes on a mortgage at all. And they talk about an interest payment is about two pence on a £150,000 mortgage. That's what they give you. And then you have to pay it back. So it, it, it's, it's, an, it's a shambles. The whole system needs a bloody good shake up. The people that are ruining us need to get out. And, and we need to be basically, I mean, we are supporting each other. Um, but, you know, I, I honestly, I, I, I don't know even from the events industry, how many parents are out there now with kids, more than one child, panicking and thinking, will there be a Christmas present under that tree? You know, and, and, and my daughter at the age of 11 knows about food banks because she's had to. And she understands, you know, when you're actually, when you've worked all your life and you have to turn around and say to your child, you can't have an ice cream or a bar of chocolate or like something for 50p. That says a lot about the, the world we're living in at the moment, you know. So please, please, whoever's out there listening to all of us on here tonight, something's got to change. Thank you, Larry. Sonali, Sonali it's yeah. Kevin. Just to let you know, Tony Scarf is on the call. He may not have been able to unmute, but I can unmute him now if you wish. Yes, sure, P please do. Tony. Hello there. Hello, Sonali. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, hello there. Hi, yeah, my name's Tony. You Scarf. sound a little quiet to me. I don't know, can everyone else hear him okay? No, no. No. Uh, Tony, do you want to try and get a little bit closer to your microphone, perhaps? Yeah, yeah sure, yeah, yeah. Can, can you hear me better now? Any better? It's still pretty quiet. Yeah, uh, it might be me. Maybe if you can shout. I, okay, just to slip me That's better, down. great. Okay, that's better, yeah, yeah. Um, so my name's Tony Scott. Um, I'm self-employed in the entertainment uh, business. Uh, I, I do, I, basically my venues are hotels, pubs, holiday ca camps, things like that, um, um, cruise ships, etc. I've been self-employed since around 2001. Uh, I appeared on a television series, basically, um, and, and it was all, all great from then on, you know. Um, so, unfortunately, um, I was told I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get SACE uh, by ATMRC because... Uh, I'd not made enough profit the last couple of years. Um, I'd, I'd uh, shelled out for a, a, a you know a car, a company car, and also uh, equipment, etc. Um, and then the same thing with Universal Credit. Um, luckily enough, my my partner works, um, so you know maybe I'm, I'm a little better better than some some people. Thank God, um, but I couldn't get Universal Credit. Now, I applied for discretionary grants uh, from Sefton Council, um, but was told because I was working from, uh, you know, self-employed from home and I didn't have a business, uh, I wasn't paying any, you know, any sort of business rates. I didn't qualify uh, from my council, even though I, I gave to them from excluded. Uh, <laughs> list uh, for uh, something called the growth platform uh, which is was another grant uh, on two occasions now I've tried that um, but there's that many people applying for these things it's on a first first come first you know serve basis basically uh, and I, I I was on a, I wasn't I wasn't being able to I couldn't get on there either I couldn't I couldn't get that uh, because the, the, the maximum applications they'd received Therefore, I, you know, I was sort of the door was closed on, on that one. Um, I spoke to me local MP Peter Dowd. I, I had with excluded, you know, which was a, a great chat, etc. Um, but unfortunately, you know, Peter's done, you know, been unable to do anything for me, uh, putting it in a nice way. Basically, I spoke to his secretary. I've, I've tweeted him. I've emailed him. You know, I know, I know, I know he's a busy man. I, I appreciate that. Um, so the only thing that helped me really was the mortgage holiday. But 
you know, my gripe with that is that you get three months where you don't have to pay, which helps you out. But they put it on the end of your mortgage, you know, you, so you, they, they recalculate everything. So your mortgage goes up. So when you, you know, even though I can't get any work, all my venues are closed. Still, have, For example, in, in, in the eight months, um, I've had two jobs, two jobs. One was in a garden, a garden place, uh, you know, and, and so I'd, I'd normally have about 30 jobs, you know, so I've lost so much money. Um, the, the only good thing for, for me was the was a loan, a personal loan I had for my car. The AA <laughs> were fantastic. They just put the, um, you know, put put the, the last three months, so it's a, so say, seven years loan. They put it seven years and three months, which helped me a, a great, great deal. You know, so I've just struggled, obviously, with my mortgage paying that. Uh, my partners had to help me, um, uh, you know, my gas, electricity. I've even had to... Pay. I did apply for a bounce back loan, and I got I got that, which was I think it was three thousand three hundred, but that's obviously gone towards my mortgage. I had to pay my accountant; he was quite patient, you know. Paid that, um, my equity membership, th- things like that, just all kinds, you know, my home insurance and stuff. Um, so, I mean, a big thing that people have touched on it is is the health issue. Cause you just feel worthless. You know, you feel where, you know, you feel like I want to do my job. I can do my job, but I've been told I can't do my job. So, okay, fair enough. Well, just help me out then. Just, you know, just a small amount of money. Just so I can clear, you know, just pay me mortgage, pay me bills every month. That's all I wanted. You know, as, as someone else said, we're not millionaires. Um, and to be excluded is, you know, there's 10% of us, there's 3 million of us. And it's a huge amount. It's not just a couple it's not you know a handful, a couple of dozen. That'd even be bad enough. But three million is ridiculous. It's crazy, um, and it, so your mental health is is suffering. Mine is, you know, sleepless nights. And as there's, there's unfortunately a lot of people taking their own lives because they, they don't see any way out. It sounds drastic, but you don't see any way out. I mean, I've got no work. All my work is being taken out of my diary. I've got no gigs coming up. Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll try and get you know something temporary for Christmas to to tie me over. But it would be nice to be included and not excluded. And thanks for Steve and, and Andy and, and Sonali and everybody. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thanks, Tony. And now we'll turn to Jennifer Shenton. Jennifer, are you there? Hi. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Um, yeah, so... I'm, um, I was excluded because I'm newly self-employed. Um, I um, started childminding in January. And um, before that, I was um, a primary school teacher for about 14 years and, and decided to be a childminder because I've got two young children. Um, so I started that in January. And then obviously in March, I was told to close and um, I wasn't eligible for any of the um, government grants because I'm newly self-employed. So, um, I mean, this this last seven months has been incredibly stressful. Um, it's It's been really difficult. I mean, my husband's had a pay cut too, um, but we are fortunate enough that um, his wages could cover um, uh, our bills and our mortgage. Um, but nothing else. So we're, we're basically, we're just trying to limit the amount of debt that we're, get, we're getting into. And um, that's, it's just really difficult um, coming up to Christmas um, with two young children. And um, it's just really upsetting. And and um, not that, um, you know, I don't think it's fair that, you know, it's fair that other people have received support or the taxpayers have received that support, but it's just so difficult um, seeing other people um, get that with support and then you you didn't you don't get anything yourself um that's been really difficult to to deal with um emotionally um it, i mean it has had a big impact on my um mental health as well um when Rishi did his um speech in march about the government support that people were going to get um and when i found out that I wasn't going to get anything um i mean i did I was I was shaking after that and um, just really just really upset. And then um, obviously with uh, 
without with seven months of no income I mean I, I don't think there's one night where I haven't woken up having a panic attack um so that's been really difficult to deal with um I mean I'd, what the, the, the problem is is I just don't I really don't understand why um as taxpayers we've been excluded and why some taxpayers have been given um financial support it just it doesn't seem fair and and um it's just been such a stressful year um, just to go through a pandemic and then just to be excluded like that really leaves you with a lot of awful feelings to deal with. Um, so like I keep asking myself, is it is it my fault that I've not received any support? Is it, you know, should I have saved up before I made the decision to go um, self-employed? Should I have saved some money up? Um, so that wouldn't be in this position financially but um so it's 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 kind of blaming yourself as well and I, and I think that's really difficult for people to have to deal with those emotions um on top of everything else thanks jennifer and i i would just stress that um in our messaging we make it abundantly clear that everyone who's been excluded in this way it it's arisen through no fault of anyone's. And I think it's important that we that we emphasize that um, at, at every opportunity because there, there is no real rationale behind why, why people have been excluded and it, and it is absolutely no fault of anyone's. Thank you for sharing your story. We'll turn to our last speaker now, uh, Duncan Meehan. Duncan. Hi, Duncan. Um, hi, Smiles. Um, I'm a, a solicitor from. Um, Duncan, I think you're you're very quiet. Um, right. okay. Do you want to try and move oh, a sorry. little close to your microphone? I am, I'm not particularly sure where the microphone is. I must admit. That's better. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, just a quick thank you um, to everybody. It's really, really useful just um, hearing everybody else's stories because we're all in the same boat. Um, uh, so it, uh, uh, there is real uh, strength in numbers. So um, hopefully people like Andy and people like Steve will be able to um, take our arguments forward and maybe we'll be able to see something coming out the other end. Uh, um, similar to everybody, it was just entirely a, a quirk of um, fate which meant I became um, self-employed as a um, solicitor in uh, uh, July 2019, the uh, kind of work I do uh, helping uh, private residential tenants. Um, uh, uh, to be honest, it's more a vocation than a job because uh, um, it doesn't pay a load of money. Uh, um, the issue is, unfortunately, and it's an issue which a few people uh, flagged up, um, there's a load of regulatory expenses which I, I, we all have to pay all the time. And so that just makes it uh, very, very difficult. To, um, people like me uh, keep my expenses as low as we possibly can, so I work from home. Um, so that means um, you're not entitled uh, um, to any grants uh, which are attached uh, to your business premises. So it's just like um, you make your next application and you think, uh, this one's going to be the one which is going to give me something then you make the application and then you fall down on a hurdle and it's it's just really really um it's just really difficult but ultimately we just all have to keep on going we all have to keep on talking to each other and we get through this the uh, there's an issue that a lot of people have um, flagged up saying that we have um, previously paid our taxes and that's absolutely right we have all paid our taxes and uh, the issue is going forward we're going to pay our taxes as well and um, so uh, when we're having to repay everything back, that's when we're going to be paying taxes. So um, it just seems fundamentally unfair. The um, kind of work which I do is um, helping tenants. Uh, so um, say if organisations, um, say if organisations like mine have gone because of what's going on um, come, um, come kind of March, April next year, when tenants really, really need help, it's going to be a really tricky time for and um, society as a whole and um, so 
uh, thank you to Excluded UK who are just kind of putting our arguments forward to the government because we just need to have society, don't we? Um, thanks, Sonali. Thank you. Thanks, Duncan. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all our speakers this evening. We've heard some really heartbreaking stories, which I'm sure sadly will resonate with many of us uh, on this call. And there's certainly some common threads that we've heard, but equally many diverse stories as well. These are just some of the stories of the excluded. There are other exclusions that apply and we haven't been able to cover all of the issues in this discussion. But what we've heard this evening really does paint a stark picture of how those excluded from meaningful support have been impacted. Thank you everyone. And I'm gonna hand over to Kevin now. Thanks very much, Sonali, and thank you so much to everyone that spoke this evening. Your, your courage in speaking out as well um, to, as I say, almost 300 people on this call is so appreciated. I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Steve Rotherham um, and then to Andy, and then we'll take some media questions and come back for the, the summary. So, Steve. Thanks. Um, I think me and Andy might be doing a, a double header on this because no doubt uh, he'll have stuff to, to add as I speak. 10 really painful stories, but one thing in common, and that is that and their confusion. So um, just while I, I can see the people who actually haven't muted, so if you can, it'd be really helpful. Um, thanks a lot. So the, the government um, have let people down and it was painful to, to listen to some of the individual stories. You're muted, Steve. Kev, whoever's um, got the, the mute, can you sort it out, please? Yeah, okay. So um, I, I'm not sure, what, yeah, I'm not muting because I'm, here's my hands with the, um, the things that people said. So they, they talked about being desolated, emotional, angry, frustrated, and uncertain about their futures. Uh, and this is something that can and should be put right. Um, our speakers could have been anybody out of the, the hundreds of people who are on this call and probably the thousands of people who are watching it who, who also have individual stories about how they've been left behind and let down by an uncaring government. And so what are the next steps so myself and Andy uh, met with um, Sonali and Darren and a few others um, the other day or the night, uh, and we think we have a way in which we can put further pressure on the government because all campaigns inevitably are about um, a groundswell. We have to get ordinary people to understand that you aren't all getting £25,000 each and are having a moan because you don't think that's enough. People have to understand that you've been left desolate because you're getting no money from central government, that you've done the right thing in many occasions. You've been advised by people to do what you've done um, because it was the best way in which the government believed that it could help um, the economy. There are plenty of individual stories that, um, people could point to where mental health and well-being has been detrimentally impacted. And we know, because we've heard some of the statistics, that some people have taken their own lives. So this needs now um, a re-emphasis, a re-energisation, re um, a way forward, uh, a campaign that can start with every single person who's watching this, whether on the call or not, writing again to your MPs. You might well have done it already. Most people will have done it. Write to your MP. Get uh, either a, an email or a letter off to your MP. Um, your MP is your representative. Your MP needs to join the APPG, uh, the all-party parliamentary group. Plenty have, plenty haven't. Your MP needs to be speaking up on your behalf. The more stories you can get on the chain in the chamber of the House of Commons, the, the more likely it will be that the government will start to have to respond to the issues that you raise. 
the government at the moment have got a a, a plan, a, a, a ploy, and that is that what they do is try and confuse the basic narrative, the questions that are being asked of them by throwing stats around, we've put £13 billion into something, we've got bounce back loans, we've done stuff on universal credit, we've increased this. If people can't access it, all of that is academic and we need more people to understand that you have been left behind and that you have been let down. So myself and Andy believe we've got a three or four point plan to go forward. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to, to Andy. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. I mean, I, I think, to be honest, the bravery of the people who've spoken tonight has empowered us, hasn't it, Steve, me and, me and you? Because uh, we always, in our campaigns, draw our strength from you. And that's what tonight was about. You know, we wanted to, in some ways, be fired up, but you've done that because it was, you were brave, but it was quite painful, obviously, listening to all of your, your, your stories. What came over to me is you're just a cross-section of the, the British public, the great British public, um, people from all walks of life doing all kinds of different different things, the heartbeat of communities, the heartbeat of the economy, employers, taxpayers, good citizens, you know, doing so many things. And and yet, you know, uh, in many ways, uh, just just ignored. You know, it was hard to hear. You know, I was listening to all of your voices as you spoke. And I think Steve and Kevin, we all could hear it. We could hear the the frustration in your voices, the exhaustion uh, was a word uh, that was used, the rejection and the pain of it and the unfairness of it. I mean, all of that was coming through. But as Steve said, we're conscious that there are some people who are not here to be heard. You know, and if this carries on, what's being created here is a mental health crisis on top of a pandemic and damage that you know will take so long uh, to be to be healed and i don't know i i'm sure everyone feels the same i just feel infuriated for you listening uh, to it particularly when you think about what money has been found for in this pandemic and what money hasn't been found for in this pandemic and that is what is infuriating uh, about the situation that you're in you know tony's phrase we just want to be included not excluded you know what what a kind of undeniable um uh, powerful phrase that uh, was so i guess i'll just wrap up by saying you know to the prime minister and the chancellor you know you're going to need to unite this great country of ours coming out of this crisis and you're going to need the people on this on this call, they are the heartbeat of your economy. You know, they are the people you're going to need to lead recovery in all of our communities, because these are the workers of the country, the hard workers, the people who get it done, get the job done. They, they, you need them on your side. We all need them to be pulling with us all, ready to, to lead recovery. And that's why you need to help them, and you need to help them now as Steve is saying, help them now. They haven't got time. We've had a whole year of this, and everyone is facing Christmas now, as, as was said. It's just not right to leave people in this position. So I'll make two calls in conclusion. First, to echo Steve, to our former colleagues in Parliament, you need to step up now, all of you. You need to listen to your constituents. You need to understand what they are going through. And then you don't just need to give them a nice chat in your surgery. You need to take those stories and you need to take them to Parliament. And we need to see a meaningful debate in government or opposition time on this issue and the exclusion of three million of our fellow citizens, our fellow taxpayers, employers from the support that the country has provided. And that debate has to happen and it has to happen now. And you need to debate it, and then you need to come up with a remedy for what we've heard tonight. Because you cannot leave people like this frozen out in the cold in the way that they are at the moment. So, Parliament, we need you now to step up and resolve this. But secondly, if there isn't action from Parliament, I would just say tonight that we will not rule out a legal route uh, to redress, to get redress for you 
in this uh, situation. So let's call it as it is. And I did hear the word, and I think Steve just used it. Call it as it is. It's discrimination. That's what it is for no good reason other than the way that you make your living. You are being discriminated against for that and nothing else. There is no other justification for what is happening here. And so if the political route won't work, we have to look at a legal, a legal route because you cannot pay tax year after year as you have. I saw somebody put a comment in the chat, newly self-employed in 2019 after 34 years, P-A-Y-E prior to this and left with nothing. What does that say about a country that has prided itself on fairness over the years? I, I, the reason Steve and I did this tonight was because we know the British public still believe in fairness and they support you. And the more they hear of your story, the more that they will support you. So there has to be redress one way or another. And we're here to support you. And when we back things, we back them all the way. Steve and I don't run campaigns by half. We know what's right and what's wrong. And what's wrong is the way you're being treated. And what's right is getting justice for you and getting support that others have had uh, this year. So you've got our support. We will back you all of the way, but we just call on everyone in Parliament tonight to unite this country coming out of this crisis and help these three million people. Include them, don't exclude them. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very much, Andy. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm going to turn to the media now for any questions. And first on my list is Rowan at BBC. Hi, uh, yeah, it's really a question for Andy and Steve Rodham, I guess. In, in terms of what you can practically do and in terms of any legal challenge, for example, I mean, how far is that away? I mean, in, in terms of what are you planning on doing next to try and move this issue forward? And at what point would you look at taking any legal action? Thanks, Rowan. The first thing any government has to do is to demonstrate that they've carried out a, a quality impact assessment uh, and not just carried one out, it has to be um, rigorous and robust. Uh, and it cannot have been carried out in a rigorous and robust way, or the conclusions would have been different because the government must know it's acting in a discriminatory fashion against the 3 million people that it has decided to leave behind. Uh, and that's what we'll do, we'll challenge on um, that and anything else that we believe uh, can demonstrate that certain uh, protected characteristics within those groups have been discriminated against. But look, it, a legal challenge is a legal challenge. It could take months, years, a legal challenge. We can't wait for months and years. Some of the, these people who've spoken tonight are desperate now and have been desperate for eight months. There are people who will lose their houses there are people whose families will be split up. There are individuals, unfortunately, who may be considering um, taking their own lives. There are mental health issues, as we've all said, that are still yet to, to fully come to the fore. We can't afford to be waiting another eight months. The government needs to do the right thing, and we'll pursue every avenue to ensure that these people are represented and that their stories are heard. Thanks, Steve. Andy? Well, briefly, I mean, Steve's, uh, Steve said it. Um, you know, it's for excluded, obviously, and, and other campaign groups to, to lead any legal challenge on behalf of the people on this call tonight. But we, we'll be there to, to provide support. And as you know, Rowan, Steve and I have experience of campaigns uh, over the years. And, you know, we, I'll say, we don't, we aren't able to, to join every campaign. But when we know there's something wrong when there's an injustice on a major scale then we we will step forward and we know there are thousands and thousands of our residents you know the people we've heard tonight speak for thousands in greater manchester they speak for thousands in the liverpool city region and while we think the parliamentary route is the best way to solve this um we cannot rule out um looking at, at the, the the legal route because i think we are seeing uh widespread discrimination here uh, and it can't be left unchallenged. 
Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much for the question, Rowan. I'm going to move across to Granada. Do we have anyone on from Granada? No. To Amy Walker at the Manchester Evening News. Hello, everyone. Hi, I've got a question for Andy, please. Um, how many people do you think are excluded in Greater Manchester? And how much do you think it would estimate it to cost to support those people who are falling through the net? Thanks, Amy. If you would just bear with me for one second, I can get you that uh, figure because I checked today. Um, so the figures that I have, and I can give the Liverpool figures as well, and Steve may have different ones, and you know, but just to, uh, to, to, to give figures for anyone from Liverpool on the call, Numbers of newly self-employed, we estimate we've got 5,600 uh, in Greater Manchester, 2,400 in the Liverpool City region. Numbers of company directors who've been excluded, 76,000 Greater Manchester, 32,000 Liverpool City region. Total number of self-employed individuals, excluding company directors and newly self-employed who are inel eligible for the self-employment support scheme, 65,900 in Greater Manchester, 25,000 in the Liverpool uh, city region. So the totals, uh, Amy, 147,500 in Greater Manchester, 59,400. Now those are the ones we can quantify from official figures, uh, but we think there are probably more as well, you know, who, who might also fall outside of those categories. But that is, you know, over 200,000 people uh, in the two regions that we we represent, and and yes, it, it would of course it will of course cost money to support uh, people uh, throughout this. But the question is 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 if the government's justification is we can't afford it? Well, I'm sorry, but that isn't a justification because it is providing support for for others, and there has to be equal treatment of all citizens, of all taxpayers. You cannot say, well, we'll support this group, but then we'll choose not to support uh, this group. So it, it will, there will be a cost, but the cost can't be the kind of uh, reason that they deny support. You know, we live, we hope, in a country that promotes equality and fairness and challenges discrimination. And as I said before, there is discrimination uh, here. So those are, those are the numbers. And these are the people I said before that we're going to need to lead the country's recovery uh, from this, to support them now so that they then can pay back in terms of uh, contribution in tax or employing people uh, when the recovery comes. That's what the logic of the furlough scheme is. It's the logic of the self-employment scheme. Why deny the same logic uh, to these uh, hardworking people who've been excluded through no fault of their own? Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Amy. Steve, I'm just going to come to Jenny at the Liverpool Echo. So you may want to part answer Amy's question in, in this one. So Jenny at the Liverpool Echo. No, OK, we don't have Jenny. Steve, did you want to respond to Amy's question as well? Just on the point about cost, of course there's a cost. Um, in 2007-8, there was about £500 billion pounds that the, the country, that the government on behalf of the country, found to bail out banks. Um, they've found money for many different types of groups, rightly so, in my opinion, during this pandemic. You, you can't choose to disenfranchise one particular group of people especially such a large group of people and give them nothing. That is not fair. And that's why I believe it's discriminatory. Thanks very much, Steve. Do we have anyone on from Sky? Is Caroline on from Sky? No. Uh, Michael Gaffney from Heart and Smooth. Evening, hi. Hi, Michael. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Um, question for the two mayors, Andy, Steve. We've, we've seen you know, people from all walks of life here tonight that, that are caught up in this and, and you know, facing destitution. What does that mean for, for your cities in terms of the recovery of the economy after COVID, let alone you know, aspirations to level up? 
I think we heard yesterday, didn't we, uh, the report from the Northern Health Science Alliance confirming what Steve and I have said all year, that the north of England has been hit harder than other places by, by the health crisis, but also by the economic crisis. And actually, it's the poorest parts of the north that have been hit hardest of all. That's the reality. And we've all been leveled down this year. So the longer this goes on without support for people, this was the point I was making a few weeks ago when we were having the debate about tier three. You can't kind of close down people's work. You can't close down their industry, the wedding industry that Mark spoke about at the beginning. You can't close it down and leave people with nothing because that does real damage, real damage to people's uh kind of families, lives, everything that they've worked for all, all these years. And it actually then delays recovery because the North won't be able to recover. You know, we have a more fragile economy here than in other parts of the country. And so the, like the 1980s, the damage then will last and we will um, struggle to come back uh, from this. That is the reality of what's happening. And, you know... <laughs> I don't want to be at loggerheads constantly with the government. We're not doing this for party political reasons. I want to make that clear to every single person on this call. If we were just seeking a campaign to sort of, oh, well, you know, we can make... No, we, we would have kind of been in touch with you ages ago. What we've been doing is watching this develop, waiting for somebody to do something, and it hasn't been done. And at this point in time, you know, we have to intervene, I think, out of kind of a basic sense of what's right and wrong, but also how our own city regions are going to, to recover from, from this. Because every day that the, the people are left out in the cold, left excluded, is a day that life gets harder for them and the recovery gets longer for us. And that's just the reality of it, Michael. So, you know, in some ways we should have done more earlier. I'd be the first to say that. And I don't want anyone to think there's, there's anything, anything other than us trying to be what we are paid to do, which is to represent people, to help you convey your, uh, your, your views. To, that's what we're doing uh, tonight. And that's, your voices are the ones that we wanted people to hear, and they have done. But, you know, if something doesn't change here, the North is going to suffer damage on a scale similar or worse to the damage we suffered in the 1980s. And a government committed to levelling up has really got to start showing that it really means it. And we want the government, we don't want to be at loggerheads with them. We want them to support the people on this call. We want them to support uh, the North. But we're hitting a bit of a crucial moment here because if they don't, you know, as I say, lasting damage is going to be done, Michael. Thanks, Andy. Thank Steve? Thanks, Kev. Michael, the best way in which you can secure the recovery is to protect businesses now so that you have a business ecosystem that you can return to when recovery happens. And from recovery, that's where we'll get growth. So the first thing that I would do is to ensure that as many businesses as it is possible to do can survive this period. And what we're doing is, uh, as a country is saying that a group three million, a group of people, um, we don't believe that they are important enough to protect so that we, when we do come out of, of the COVID um, issue and in a, a post-COVID world, we, we will need those people because we'll need something to go back to. And what I'm trying to do in the city region that I represent and Andy is in his, is to see whether we can um, help and assist but the government needs to step up, as Andy said. The government has to uh, do its bit, and together we can save as many businesses as possible, which means that when we do get to that post-COVID recovery, then we'll have the best chance to hit the ground running. Thanks very much, Steve. Thanks, Michael. Do we have Adam Clark from Roch Valley Rodeo? Adam? No. Okay. 
that's all the media questions that I've been informed about, unless um, someone can indicate to me. It's a bit difficult through the chat because there are so many comments. Um, but if you can indicate, one of my colleagues will see as well. If not, Kevin, do you mind if I just say then something? Thank you. Briefly? So yeah, so Andy, and then I was going to hand over to Sonali. Yeah, just just very very briefly, just to. Um, Thank everyone for joining. It's been amazing to see the comments coming in, as you said, Kevin, and they're coming in from all over the country. So thanks, everyone. But I want to just, if I may, just, just say this, and this is on behalf of, of, of Steve uh, and, and, um, and myself. I want to thank uh, Mark. I want to thank James. I want to thank Marie. I want to thank Tony, uh, Becky, spoke so powerfully, Becky, Helen, Lowry, Tony, other Tony, Jennifer and Duncan. I mean, Really, it takes some some guts to step forward and speak in the way that you did tonight, but but you did it and you said everything that needed to be said, all of you. And I don't, you know, if if you could have put the British public in front of you, if they could all have heard you, 99.9% .9 would be 100% with you. And I think that's just really important uh, for us for us to say. So, you know, as I say, it's taken us all quite long to, hit, to get a sense of this campaign excluded have done a brilliant job but as i said now we know about it and we know about you and we know about the injustice steve and i will back you back you all of the way and we do call on our colleagues in parliament uh, to do the same so sonali over to you um to, to maybe draw a close to proceedings but uh, thanks again everybody for joining us thanks andy thanks steve um thanks to both of your teams who've worked very rapidly behind the scenes and equally thanks a massive thanks to the um excluded uk team who all came together in such a short space of time to make this event um so powerful and impactful and of course thank you to all of you who shared your stories so powerfully and so courageously this evening and everyone who's joined us and as i said before i think um much of what we've heard tonight resonates so strongly with all of us. And hearing um, the support from, from yourself, Andy, Steve, um, it's only furthered our resolve to keep on advocating for parity of support, which is what we've been uh, fighting for from, from the very beginning and will continue to do so. Um, so a big thank you to uh, everyone and um, we'll keep on keeping on. Um, with uh, with the message of parity. One thing, Sonali, yes. we might do is maybe, uh, Steve mentioned Sadiq uh, earlier on this evening. He mentioned yeah. Dan. I think we'll build out this campaign with our mayoral colleagues in other parts of the country and bring more and more voices into this conversation. More and more people who've been shut out. Let's get more and more voices in. Keep telling these stories until something is done. So Steve and I will, you know, will commit to uh, to building this campaign out with our with our mayoral colleagues around the country and hopefully we can perhaps do one with Sadiq soon. So we'll, we'll, we'll get onto that and uh, we'll keep building this with you. So well done everyone excluded. Thank you, Kevin, for chairing us. And Just uh, before you do, Andy, um, just uh, thanks to Sonali there for the summing up. Colleagues, just so that you know, there's been in the region of 300 people on this Zoom call this evening. It's, it's fluctuated a bit, but around 300 people. We've had the media on listening in, so even if not all of the media asked questions, others have been listening in. We have recorded um, the event this evening, so we will make that available to Sonali and her team at Excluded UK. It's been live streamed on various Facebook groups as well, and we've also captured all of the comments that you have submitted. So thank you so much, friends, for doing that for us this evening. Um, and we will keep you informed via Sonali and her team at Excluded UK as to what the next steps are going to be. But thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you.